Okay, good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start now. I, uh, I'm Ken Gelbert. I am a member of the Federal Bar Association section on Energy, the Environment, and Natural Resources, ENR. All law students and all lawyers who are not members of the Federal Bar Association to take the opportunity to get out to fedbar.org and sign up and become a member of the environmental section. And for those who attended the uh, presentation downstairs, the Indian law section as well. Um, we've got uh, some talking to do about climate change and maladaptation. And uh, rather than trying to explain that, we'll leave it to our speakers. It was an amazingly accomplished uh, group of people. It's uh, embarrassing to be up here to talk about how much these people have achieved in their lives. Uh, Barrett Ristoff will be starting us off. She is originally from Cajun country around here and has her JD from this very law school uh, back in 2004. Has personally studied tropical and Arctic countries of the Pacific Rim. Uh, has been a mediator for the Superior Court of Alaska. Uh, she's of California. Will? We'll be, uh, we'll ju we just, uh, tr just uh, hang on. We've decided to try and let you watch the beginning of the panel before you come in. So can you see us? I can. Very oh, now I can't. <laughs> I could a moment ago. Okay, but you can at least hear us, correct? Yes. Okay, then we're, go we're going to get underway. Um, okay. Um, she is of counsel with a law firm in Fairbanks, Alaska, and has her own business in planning and research for her native... Uh, Alaska Native Villages uh, has been doing planning and research for such uh, for quite some time, uh, especially relating to adaptation to climate changes. And she is a PhD candidate in that field at the University of Hawaii. Uh, she's going to enlighten us as to what's happening where regarding climate change adaptation and maladaptation and what can be done. We also have with us Professor Jim Blackburn of Rice University, a voice in the wilderness of Houston about climate change, uh, a very, very brave man uh, in a state that lives and dies by fossil, fossil fuel. Uh, he teaches both environmental law and uh, sustainable environment design at Rice University. He has many publications, including a book of poems and paintings. Uh, he has his own planning firm, and he's going to be talking with us about uh, some possible engineering uh, reactions, I can't say solutions, to the problems caused by climate change. And we have, uh, unfortunately by Skype, but fortunately uh, available, Dr. Will Burns, who is a PhD in international law at the University of, uh, environmental law, excuse me, international environmental law at the University of Wales, Cardiff, was Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs in uh, Wisconsin. Executive Director of uh, the uh, Center for International Studies, uh, the Pacific Center for Inter uh, International Studies, where he <clears throat> worked on international wildlife protection treaties. Uh, he's involved with John Hopkins Energy Policy Climate Change Program. Currently co-founding director of a forum for climate engineering at the Berkeley, California branch of American University School of International Service. He has an absolute multitude of publications, and now we're going to turn you over to people who actually know something. Thank you. Join the Federal Bar Association. So I'm Barrett. I'm talking about maladaptations, and let's see. There we go. Um, so I try to be like David Sedaris and just read what I wrote, um, since I'm not a very good speaker, except unlike David Sedaris, I'm not funny. So here we go. Um, talking about maladaptations, and you're probably wondering why they brought me all the way from Alaska to come back here and talk to you, besides the fact that I'm from this area originally. Alaska actually has a lot in common with Louisiana. It's, I like to say Alaska is 50 years behind Louisiana in terms of oil and gas development, and I hope it never catches up. But besides that, Alaska has a lot of beautiful natural landscapes that local people depend on. It also has a lot of problems with flooding and erosion. We know in Louisiana this is not just due to climate change, but the increasingly severe storms that are related to climate change are aggravating the erosion problems. And just like in Louisiana, how the loss of the wetlands is causing a problem because they would buffer the hurricanes, 
Alaska is losing some of the ice that used to adhere to the seashore and protect the villages from the fall storms. So one thing I got interested in during my research is the unintended consequences of adaptation efforts or strategies that backfire. This term, maladaptation, it describes the negative impacts that can affect a community down the road from an adaptation or negative impacts to other communities. So what exactly is a maladaptation depends on your perspective. I have a picture of this failed effort to address erosion in the native village of Shishmaraf on the west coast of Alaska. I asked someone from the agency responsible for that structure what they thought about it now. And here is the answer that I got. So to some people, that revetment was not a maladaptation it, because it did buy them a little time. This answer brings me to the next question about why maladaptations happen. If you're an elder at risk of a heat stroke on a hot day in New Orleans and you can afford to turn on the air conditioner, you would not think twice about doing this, even if it's going to contribute to climate change in the long term. Now, I'll point out another example of this irony. I listened to an interview with the BBC's Matt McGrath interviewing Alaska Governor Bill Walker talking about climate change and well, the villages that are washing away because of it. He talked about Alaska's fiscal crisis and how expensive it would be to relocate the villages. And you can read this quote yourself, but the idea is that Alaska has to add more to climate change by drilling for oil to pay to relocate the villages that need to move because of climate change. So on some level, maladaptations happen because people do what they think they need to do for self-preservation right now, even if this has negative long-term consequences. I don't have a lot of solutions for correcting human nature, other than I would really like to have legislative representatives appointed to represent future generations, or I like to try to empower communities that are stuck with environmental injustice. Sometimes this is really more of a social issue than a legal issue, but it's something that policymakers need to be aware of so they don't make the problem worse. I do have some ideas for some of the maladaptations that I've seen with Alaska villages trying to adapt, so I'll be talking more specifically about these in my presentations. I mentioned before that there is a lot of what I call hard armoring, and that's like seawalls and levees, and a lot of that takes place on the west coast of Alaska and it's not always very well thought out. Some of this could be an institutional problem related to the way the Army Corps is set up and its mission to build bigger and better barricades. Uh, sometimes the people working on hard armoring projects have not really looked at the natural processes going on in the area. So in some places in Alaska, people will build these barriers to erosion in places that are actually accreting, so you end up with sand in front of the barrier. There's also permafrost, which makes Alaska different. We have lots of examples of things being built on top of permafrost, which then melts. So before you set up a barrier, you've got to study the area first enough to understand the sediment flow and whether there are quirks like permafrost. But one challenge is that agencies and communities can be paralyzed by the need to study a problem. It's kind of like the precautionary principle taken to an extreme. The researchers who write articles are always calling for more research and agencies give out lots of money for data collection, very little for actually carrying out projects. This has led to researchers and villages adapting by collecting data, and some people I interviewed don't even know what they're gonna do with this data. So in short, there has to be enough study of a problem before investing in infrastructure that will fail if the data is wrong, but agencies and communities cannot just keep investing in data collection with no follow-up. One of the best ways to get information needed is to talk to people who live in a community and have seen what hasn't worked in the past. Probably the most common conversation that I have with Alaska community residents is that a contractor putting in one of these structures never talked to the residents before putting it in, and the structure just did not fit for the local conditions. So the seawall is one of the most well-known well -known forms of adaptation, and it can be really useful to protect critical infrastructure, but it ends up often eliminating the beach in front of that and directs the wave energy to somewhere else that ends up eroding. The costs are high, and like levees, it can lead to a false sense of security. People are starting to look at soft armoring, like the creation of dunes, 
but this has its own drawbacks, like requiring a lot of dredging, taking up a lot of space, and changing habitats. One person I interviewed from Alaska described their seawall as the demarcation point from the historic relationship that people had with the shoreline of their community. He called it a necessary evil and said that it had, in fact, protected the road and infrastructure. So one important way to avoid maladaptations is to do a better job of thinking about the future. And our laws don't always do this. At the federal level, our law is designed to clean up after the fact, clean up after the problem rather than to prevent the problem. We do have programs for hazard mitigation under the Stafford Act that are supposed to prevent disasters, but the big funding only comes after the big disaster and in the federal disaster declaration. The only villages in Alaska that have been able to fully relocate in modern times have done so with the big money that comes after disaster declaration. This leaves the other villages kind of wondering when they're going to wash away. The legal fix to that is relatively simple. It involves more appropriations from Congress to pre-disaster programs that already exist and requiring states and localities and residents to shoulder more of the after-disaster cost. There are political will problems here as well as personal will problems. Most people don't want to raise local taxes, especially if they think that there might be a federal bailout coming. And a lot of people really want to keep living where they are by the water, especially if this is their traditional homelands. A similar problem is that our laws facilitate rebuilding in the same flooded out place rather than moving to higher ground. So the true cost of our national flood insurance program are not supported by those who choose to live in the floodplains. Again, the, the legal fix is relatively simple. There was a 2012 law called the Bigger Waters Act addressing this, but it was rolled back in 2014 due to public outcry. So some takeaways from this presentation, they're not really revolutionary, they're kind of inside the box, um, and that's maybe me being pessimistic and not envisioning a massive political change. Um, one is just better communication of the risks and measures that are being proposed to addressing them. Another is taking smaller incremental measures before building massive projects that might not work. One more is no regret strategies or taking measures that have benefits in multiple areas. This way, even if climate change or flooding doesn't happen as predicted or the project doesn't have the adaptation benefits that we thought it would, it's still useful. A key example is projects that protect wetlands, which serve as hurricane buffers and also provide habitat to important species. A final thought is to acknowledge our political and human tendencies and try to work with them rather than around them. If people are not going to move out of floodplains, Maybe we need to have better technology to elevate them. I don't know who will be willing to give up their air conditioners, so designing them to reduce carbon emissions may be a path forward. So with that, I think it's time to turn over the presentation to other people that may have other practical solutions. And I believe next up we're going to have, go ahead, Dr. Burns. Oh, Jim Blackford, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about Houston, and uh, we've had, uh, as you probably have all seen more than you probably cared to see about, a horrific tragedy, um, perhaps comparable on certain levels to Katrina, but I think probably very different in, in many ways. Uh, but uh, I want to, first of all, just echo a lot of what Barrett said. Barrett did, I think, a wonderful job of, of summarizing many of the issues that anybody, any of us that are working on these issues face. I am uh, working, I'm, I'm co-director of the Severe Storm Center at Rice University. We have been working on Severe Storm since Hurricane Ike in 2008. And then Harvey came along and we've been talking, I think probably to every media in the world ever since, it seems like. Um, let me start off with our maladaption. This is a headline talking about climate change blindness. I think that's the governor of Florida that's shown there, but Governor Abbott of Texas also is a climate change denier. There are those that actually may get fired in Austin if they talk about climate change. 
Uh, there's a code in Texas for climate change. It's called weird weather. And, um, and then, fortunately, it's a very sad circumstance, but literally, uh, it's, it's just not an issue. It's just not talked about. It is not discussed. At the Harris County level, our flood control district does not think uh, climate change uh, is involved in flooding. Now, I think you'll see after this presentation that they're very wrong. But I think politically, this is what they feel they have to admit. And so, and you know the situation at the national governmental scale. So we're getting no signals locally from any governmental entity about climate. And so it's only if we talk about it publicly uh, in any chance we get that these issues come up. And yet, beyond all that, the public believes the climate is changing in Houston, amazingly enough. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about Houston. I just want you to have those of you that have been to Houston may have spent most of your time inside that inner circle, which is Loop 610. Beltway 8 is the second. We've got a third loop called um, the Grand Parkway that's not really shown on this. The point I want to make, though, is the different colors that you see on these. Each one of these different colors is a different watershed. And so we have a lot of very small watersheds going through Houston. We have a big river, San Jacinto River on the right-hand side, and the Brazos River comes across the bottom on the left-hand side. But most of the Houston-Harris County area is basically divided up in 22 watersheds. And so we can have a very quick flash flooding event anywhere within this city. And it, and it just may help explain some of the things. Now, Harris County put out this title for Tropical Storm Allison back in 2001, off the charts. Uh, you could not describe what climate scientists talk about more so than severe weather events being off the chart because of climate change. I don't think they ever understood that they had actually just sort of put the exact language in this report cover that climate scientists would use to talk about the type of weather events we're having. In this case, we got 25 inches of rain in 12 hours over here on the far right-hand side of Harris County, up in the northeast sector. Our, our, they, you know, the amount of rain that we had doubled the 100-year storm and basically was 50% greater than the 500-year storm. We had a cold front that came in in 2016 that generated the tax day flood. This was, a, according to the statistics, a 10,000-year event up in the northwest portion of Harris County and it flooded and put record flood flows in every one of those streams that you see shown on this map. Mainly a storm that stayed to the west northwest. Then we had Harvey. The four day 500 year storm is 21 inches. We had over 40 inches. You're not supposed to double the 500 year storm with the amount of rainfall you get. This is a map of the 100-year flood plain for Houston and Harris County. It is obsolete. It is dangerous. Obsolete and dangerous, period. Yet that is the basis for all of the planning that is being done. This is a new draft that came out from um, NOAA Atlas 14 work. The areas shown in green and various colors other than gray are areas where going through the statistics by adding the last 20 years of statistics onto the previous 40 or 50 years, we are showing increased amounts of rainfall for the so-called 100-year storm. Uh, in Harris County, our 100-year storm is uh, 13 inches in 24 uh, hours right now. It's going up to 16 or 17. But that's basically weighted against statistics from 50, 60 years ago. That is not a reflection of climate change but it is picking up the heavier new rainfall events. I would tell you every coastal city on the Gulf Coast, probably the Atlantic, and I'm not sure about the Pacific, is facing the exact same problem because the heat of the oceans is, is, is going up. That fuels tropical storms. That causes more evaporation. That generates lower pressures that also add to more evaporation. We just finished a conference at Rice on uh, basically the future of the Houston region and, and these issues. And every climate scientist on the panel said her, a storm like Harvey is not, it's not a question of if it will happen again. It's simply a question of when and where. So we're going to be seeing these type of events more frequently than what we've seen in the past. Yeah? Does that call into question uh, the calculation of the X number year storm? 
Of course it does. It's totally thrown out. As far as I'm concerned, the scientists I'm dealing with would like to get rid of the 100-year storm and simply put extremely high risk, medium risk, less risk. Everything in Houston can flood. It's just there are certain areas that are a lot worse than flooding. We think the 100-year flood, as it's currently done, is obsolete and dangerous. That map I put up with those words was very serious. We've got to be honest about climate change. Our denial about climate change is really hurting us. It's going to kill people in Houston. It's going to kill people on the Gulf Coast because we're not dealing with this. Now, let me just kind of try to be a... I'm going to play climate scientist. I'm not. Uh, this is the bell curve of distribution. The 100-year flood would be right here at the 1% level. So, you know, you want to, you know, out here are your rarer events. This is where most of your rainfall events occur. It's in the middle. That is Tropical Storm Allison that I talked about, 2001. It's over there about a thousand-year storm event. Tax day wasn't quite that bad in Harris County for the most part. And there's Harvey. Bang, bang, bang. That's not supposed to happen. That's not where you should be seeing. Your, your big storms should be in the 2%, 5% range, something like that. They're not supposed to be out here. One of the best presentations I ever saw about the, um, uh, this curve is that, uh, the bell curve, is that this, uh, it was a stockbroker talking about the bell curve, and he drew these big red lines. And he, you know, right there at about the 1%, with TBD on the other side of each of them. Well, to be determined doesn't make a lot of sense. Says there be dragons. There are dragons at the edge of the bell curve. And these are the climate dragons that we're seeing, and they're real. And we're not dealing with them. Now, something that I've discovered that I think is fascinating is that I'm a lawyer. My duty is to my client. Our duties collectively as lawyers to our client. That's not true with engineers. The engineer's client is the public. Although many of the engineers in Houston act more like lawyers than lawyers. They're advocates. They're adversaries. But that's not their job. Not according to Texas law, and I think this is pretty uniform across the board. Engineers' duty is to the public. What they build is important from a public safety standpoint. Now, what does an obsolete 100-year floodplain mean? Every one of these things is built to 100-year standards. Ultra-hazardous chemical facilities, hazardous waste storage, treatment and disposal operations, public water supply, sanitary landfills, major highways and freeways. You name it, we use the 100-year storm as the basis for it. If you're an engineer, what's your obligation if you're building one of these things? Is it your obligation to build to what the law tells you to build to? Or is it your obligation to say, you know, this hundred year, it's not, you can't rely on it. It's obsolete and dangerous. I raised this at the conference that was full of engineers. You could have heard a pin drop after I raised that question. They did not think very favorably about my presentation. I, these are uh, some of our both older and existing landfills many of which are right at the edge of the 100-year floodplain in the Houston region. These are wastewater treatment plants, every one of which is right in the edges, if not within, and protected by a levee system to the 100-year level. They all went under in Harvey, and they'll all go under again and again and again. And if we don't change this, we're going to keep rebuilding to this very same standard. I consider that maladaption, or perhaps no adaption. Um, this is Braze Bayou in Houston. Uh, Rice University is, I don't know, that's the first one. Where's Rice? Rice is about in the middle up there. Uh, but this light blue area is increases in the 100-year floodplain between probably about 1980 and 2004 because of upstream development. So on the one hand, we did this to ourselves with our lack of regulation. Uh, but that's really not climate change related. We've got a project to come in and fix that. 
and we've got a channelization, an engineering solution. You know, one of Barrett's type of solutions where they come in and put structures in to, to address this. And if they do that, they're going to move the 100-year floodplain down to that little area in blue. We're going to take the brown out and make the blue. But now we're going to increase our floodplain again because it's not a large enough rainfall event. And so we're going to increase it again, but we don't tell anybody how big it's going to be after we fix it. So we're inviting everyone to move into the area that's going to be vacated because we've really always thought about the floodplain as an impediment to development as opposed to something that is actually for the safety of people. And that's a huge mistake. Dangerous real estate. This is a 100-year floodplain. Safer real estate. The areas that are outside, well beyond and that are developed, which would be the dark color in this map of Houston. This would be the safer real estate to work with. I'm not saying any of it is safe. In the Netherlands, they have actually made room for waterways. They have actually, in this map, the levee used to be on the river wall back over here. They actually picked it up and moved it and evacuated people out of the way to make more room for the water we're going to have to make more room for the water. We have tried to push water and confine it, and it work it. We're going to have to give the, the river more room. We're going to have to make room for those bayous that we have. The green space can be used in various ways, but we need the space. Along the coast, we can figure out some way to pay landowners to keep them from developing their land that is, the, in red, the dangerous real estate of the Texas coast. That's basically the 20-foot contour line. Uh, this is the non-structural concepts we're coming up, except we don't regulate. Counties have no zoning power. And then we've got this behemoth called the Houston Ship Channel, which is probably the largest petrochemical industrial complex in the world. And uh, if we'd modeled a storm like Harvey, we would have been laughed out of Houston because it never happened before. And this map here is our estimate of what a true surge event hitting just at the exact right location, what it would do to the Houston Ship Channel. It sent a 25-foot surge up the Ship Channel. Those plants, those chemical facilities, none of them are, are protected beyond 15 feet. And we've never seen a surge higher than 15 feet. And so I'm telling people they have to plan for it, and they're all telling me, you're crazy, we've never seen anything like that. That's the best thing about Harvey, is that now I can say, you, you would have told me the same thing about that storm, and it's very real. We have trouble understanding this. If it happens, it'll be the worst environmental disaster in United States history. There is no question about that. 90 million gallons of oil and hazardous substances would be released Exxon Valdez was 10 million, Deepwater Horizons 200 million, and it would all go into Galveston Bay. So, we may be looking at something like this. The hardest thing I've ever done as an environmentalist is try to weigh the benefits of putting in some sort of massive structural solution that Barrett was talking about, as opposed to leaving that ship channel to flood and possibly causing the worst environmental disaster in the United States. We have no choice about this. That situation is built. We have to deal with it, and it's the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my career. And we're getting no help at all from any level of government in dealing with it. Thank you very much. Wish it was more optimistic. It's not. Well, it, it is data-driven. What Again, we're looking at with hurricanes to be the size of the hurricane. And a storm, that, and we used to call them categories 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, or a tropical storm. And there's a bell curve distribution of the frequency of those storms by size. 
with most of the storms hitting in the middle, and then you start getting up to the Katrinas, or you get up to perhaps the Audrey's or the Carla's on the Texas coast. Uh, Ike, though, was only a Category 2 storm, but it had a big surge, so there's some variations like that. And all of that has to be put on those distributions, and they assign frequencies to them. And the same problem is occurring with these big hurricanes as with the rainfall events, is it's all skewing now toward the edge of the bell curve because there's more heat out there. And hurricanes and tropical storms, their rotation is essentially an engine that's fueled by the heat of the ocean. If you, can, if you check out after Harvey went through the Bay of Campeche and up into the Gulf, the difference in the heat before and after Harvey went through is just incredible. And Harvey intensified from a tropical cyclone to a Category 4 hurricane in 24 hours. That had never happened before in the history of hurricanes, which is a factor of the heat of the ocean. The Gulf was one of the hottest uh, bodies of water in the world at the time that Harvey came along. And so that's, it's the same phenomena. It's the same statistical methods with, again, the skew at the edges. And, again, it's one of those things that, that they're just having a hard time hard time understanding. Okay, now, I don't know. Uh, Barrett, can, you may be the best one of us to get them up there. Is Dr. Burns still here? Well, Oh, the call ended. Let's try to get him right back. It will take just a minute. And while we're doing this, maybe you want to foot is a reasonable surge under current conditions if we factor climate change in just moderately with some sea level rise and things like that it'll be a, you know easily 30 33 feet in the Houston ship channel and Barker Reservoirs were two of the best flood control pieces of equipment ever built. The rainfall that Harvey generated was the largest they'd ever seen. 
So again, it was designed for a certain frequency storm, and that design was exceeded. Now, they actually had a high enough levy, but they didn't own enough property going back. So one thing, there are people that bought within the flood pool of Addicts and Barker and were never told about it. Huge lawsuit going on about that right now. They also uh, had to let water out because they were starting to come around the edge of the reservoir. And actually, those two reservoirs have been designated as two of the six most dangerous reservoirs in the United States. And that was done in 2010 before anybody ever thought about Harvey. And so the Corps has been nervous as they can be about the, whether those dams would hold up. And they actually ran simulation models of what would happen with dam collapse during Harvey. And you don't want to even begin to think about what that looked like. They had to release the water to keep the dams from crumbling. So that your mother living downstream was in a zone that generally has no problems because of Addicts and Barker's protection. But, you know, unfortunately, that was just what happened when they had to release the water, and there's no guarantee they won't have to do it again. But I guess that's the question. Because they may have to do it again, and that's a man-made flood. That, that was not something that was going to flood exactly. But it did flood. Well, actually, if the dams weren't there, it would flood. Well, sure. And that's going to be the defense of the government to the lawsuit, is that if the dam had not been there, it would have flooded worse. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just saying, it, it's, you know, we have allowed everybody to move in close to the river because we had those structures. Again, making the point that, that, that one of Barrett's slides did, that it was much, um, you know, it kind of gave a false sense of security to some extent to a lot of people that you could you know, live there. Uh, on the other hand, if that whole system broke, it's everything between I-10 and US-59 all the way to downtown that would be underwater, so. What we have is a disaster-driven system, one that only will come up with something after a huge problem has occurred. There's no accident that they're FEMA maps because there had to have been an emergency to spur people to draw up these maps. And uh, what, what you're essentially doing is saying, we're gonna have a, have a disaster based on the stuff we know about. Uh, but we're not going to extrapolate. Okay, in the back, please. There's a website you can go to called B, B as in boys, C as in cat, BC Initiative. We have started something called the Bayou City Initiative. And our goal with that is to educate the basically flood literacy for the public and flood literacy for the politicians. And we're basically going to have basically training sessions for politicians uh, where we will basically have citizens that will be on a panel as well. But we're going to be kind of talking to them. The way our districts are gerrymandered, each one of those politicians that we elect has some piece of those various watersheds. Few people in Houston know what watershed they live in, much less do the politicians know which watershed they represent. So part of this is going to be getting an, a public that's smart enough and informed enough to ask good questions to the politicians who then have to be informed enough to answer. And hopefully we can begin to build up that understanding that way. Uh, not as an appointed employee, not as an appointee, but any elected official we can get to. Yes. I think that's the system that, that has been fostered all these many years. And unfortunately, uh, it, it, it's sort of like, you know, you know that there's money coming. I mean, every signal tells people to rebuild where they got flood. You know, we don't have money to buy people out and move them. And all of your mortgage history, trying to keep your credit history, all of that says, I'll try to go back into where I have a mortgage, where I have essentially my investment and make it work and maybe it won't flood again. We've got people that have been flooded three, four, five times. And
and FEMA now will buy you out after the third flood if you're in the 100-year floodplain and if you had flood insurance. But the 100-year floodplain, 50% of our damages are outside the 100-year floodplain. And there is nothing magical about the 100-year mark. It's simply an arbitrary one that was set up because it sounded like a nice round number. Yeah, the Dutch uh, used 10,000 to 100,000 year uh, kind of considerations in their thinking. I've been talking to a lot of citizens about this. It's real sober. You know, I put my 100 year floodplain map up on the wall, and all of a sudden, this citizen comes up to me and said, Look, I've flooded twice in the last 10 years. What's this 100 year stuff you're talking about? And it kind of brings you down a little bit and realize that we're, maybe this 100 year stuff is really disserving us. But that means rewriting the entire practice manual and everything we do relative to flooding. And, and let me just tell you, even with the criteria that currently exist, there are legal problems. There's a lot of pushback. I worked for many years uh, on dams and waterways law for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And if you told somebody, no, you can't stick your property, uh, extend, you know, fill in and uh, extend your property out there to build your garage or your dump site or your factory or whatever, uh, because you are building within the prohibited 100-year uh, floodplain, they turn around and file a lawsuit for a regulatory taking. I, I think people here must be somewhat familiar with that concept. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in property rights states, that's yeah. a serious uh, lawsuit. A absolutely. Uh, you're, you're taking my property without due compensation. Uh, you're, turning it, you're turning my uh, commercially viable property into an ecological park. Uh, who cares whether it's, you know, it's going to flood out my neighbors the next time we get a, a five to ten year storm? That's their problem. Uh, so there's not a lot of understanding or acceptance about the, the, uh, the, the general principles of what's going on. And without that generalized understanding, it's kind of hard to get people moving. And, and I just throw out one more thing. I mean, so what we've been pushing, is he, is he ready? Uh, no, no. no. Uh, we, sorry, we We're have lost um, Wilbur, so can you just have us the rest of the time? <laughs> but anyway, what I was going to say, living with flooding is the reality of Houston. And are we just going to have to learn to live with floods? Sir? Well, we lost, uh, oh, anywhere, but in the, along the ship channel at one time, the subsidence had reached eight to nine feet. Uh, we lost three to four feet down in the Clear Lake area, which is along Galveston Bay. We had a bowl, of, we have a bowl of subsidence that uh, pretty much was stopped, I would say, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And it has, you know, and all of those adjustments have been made to the engineering diagrams and things like that. So there were impacts from fluids uh, taking, being taken out of the ground. We have stopped really groundwater usage at any large scale at all. And we are bringing most of our water in now from the Trinity or from the San Jacinto River. No, it's just that that's now the new elevation reality, and so they're much more prone to particularly hurricane surge flooding than they used to. It hadn't affected the riverine flooding so much as it actually created a little more slope um, in a you know, kind, of, you know, kind of dark humor type of way. But. Sea level rise is going to contribute to essentially the base of whatever problem we've got. But I would tell you on the scale of the things that we're seeing, it's really the, the storm size and intensity and not just tropical storms. I mean, we had, uh, we name our storms, it seems like we have the tax day, we have the Halloween, we have the Memorial uh, Day floods. And all of those were cold fronts. They just stalled when they got down to the coast and dumped an incredible amount of rain. And uh, those are just, uh, frankly, just aberrant systems, or what you would have called aberrant systems that just seem to be occurring all the time now.
But those are the ones that are attracting the attention, not sea level rise. So Barrett, what, what kind of direct impacts are the, the native villages seeing in Alaska? There are really different types, actually, in terms of all the flooding, because I talked about that ice being the protective barrier, kind of like the wetlands in Louisiana on the west coast and north coast. And so it's not as much sea level rise as there is sea level rise. It's more that the ice is gone, so the fall storms come in, and they go right over the land because there's nothing to stop them. There's also different patterns of rainfall, heavier rainfall coming in. We actually have um, some places in Alaska where the land is rising, so sea level is not a problem because the glacier is melting and the weight of the glacier is gone, so the land actually lifts up. It's called isostatic rebound. Um, there's, there's been plenty of flooding throughout time in the interior of Alaska along the rivers and erosion, but the thing that happened before was that people would just pick up and move. They could go wherever they wanted to. They were essentially migrating to different places up until as late as the 1940s, but everything kind of got ossified and this western infrastructure that's very expensive and hard to move got put in and now there's just not the freedom to pick up and move like there was before to adapt to these floods. Mm -hmm. Can we have a question over here? Okay, yes. Yeah, uh, I guess one of the questions that you brought out uh, the idea of uh, sewage infrastructure, water infrastructure, how Zero. Unfortunately, I mean, it should be a key, a key issue, uh, but it's just not being talked about. You know, I mean, we are talking about removing houses, and I mean, so that's a big increase, because see, that used to be thought of in terms of failure as in, you know, we have the Harris County Flood Control District, and you can't be controlling flooding and buying people out and evacuating areas, so it was almost like an admission of failure. Now I think it is actually be beginning to be seen as a legitimate responsive strategy. And that in a way is a breakthrough. And you know, to some extent we're extremely over-engineered in Houston and under -planned. And I mean, you know, kind of using both of those terms in you know, almost a, a straight meaning. We, we don't like to not engineer. Barry, can you talk a little bit about the kind of planning you've been working on with the native uh, Alaskan villages? I can talk about that, and I also want to mention something about, well, just to comment on what was said about, well, I wanted to get into the ethical issues a little bit of this issue of, you know, the moral hazard and the responsibility for moving people and who should move. And it's, it's easy, and I was almost kind of flippant in my presentation where I'm saying, well, you know, people really shouldn't live by the water and expect for the government to bail them out. It's, it's also really worth acknowledging that a lot of people kind of got pushed into certain areas that could have been less desirable and simply don't have the money to go somewhere else. And so it can be a little bit of an environmental justice issue about who should pay for it. Um, and particularly in my work with the Alaska Native communities, the people a lot of times did not choose to live in that precise location. That location was before their fishing camp where they were at at one point in the year. But because it was easy access to a barge, and easy to put the infrastructure there, they ended up being situated there permanently. And of course, these, these communities don't have a tax base. They don't have any real income or anything to do their own move. And so it becomes a little bit of a, an ethical issue or an environmental justice issue about who should pay for the move and who is in the best position to do it. And I think that's where climate justice comes in, in terms of those who maybe got this system going out of whack, have a greater responsibility to help those that are less responsible get out of the system, get out of that harm's way. At the same time, I think there's also part of climate justice has a procedural aspect where you want to avoid the federal government or someone marching down and saying, okay, everyone here, now you have to move. Uh, or, or especially in the case of these Alaska Native villages, the, the most common thing that people are thinking of is, okay, um, you're a little village of 400 people or whatever, and it would cost 200 million to relocate you, so we're not gonna do that. Um, you can just go ahead and move back to uh, one of the big cities like Anchorage or something like that. And of course, people don't wanna do that, and, and people talk about it in terms of cultural genocide. And so that's, it's an issue that I'm grappling with right now as I am 
working on the relocation of one of these very erosion prone, flood prone villages. Um, there's never enough federal money to make this happen. Uh, we're hoping that we, there, we will be able to cobble together enough different funds to get this village over to where it wants to be. But there's no assurances. And then there's maybe 30 or so more villages waiting in line for, for them to get moved. And it's you get into some really hard ethical issues about what to do. As far as the question of planning, um, that's a problem in Alaska. When I first got into this line of work, I just thought, oh my gosh, no one's planning. Why doesn't everyone have a plan? Uh, everyone needs to have a plan to deal with flooding. And as I got further into it, I realized there are a lot of hazard mitigation plans in existence. This is something that FEMA does, and it requires communities to have hazard mitigation plans in order to get some of the money uh, for hazard mitigation grants that can help with relocation. But at least in Alaska and maybe in other communities too, these are kind of top-down plans that are often done by outside contractors and they'll come in and kind of, the state will hire a contractor to do a swath of, of, of plans for several communities and they'll be cut in pace and they'll be talking about permafrost in southeast Alaska where there is none. It's kind of like whenever Minerals Management Service believed that walrus were in the Gulf of Mexico after the BP spill because you have these cut and paste plans that are not really done with a lot of community input. And this is another, again, social justice aspect, and it's also a very practical thing, because if you do want to plan for flooding, you do want to avoid maladaptations, then you really want to have a process that meaningfully brings in community participation. Yeah, so let, let me just add to that. I mean, again, what Barrett says is absolutely right on. Something to look at. The Corps of Engineers uses benefit cost ratios to determine like structural solutions, for example, which streams would get channelized in Houston. But if you just make the assumption our unit channelization cost is uh, the same for whether you're in a low income or a higher income area, we basically skew the whole analysis to favor flood control in wealthy areas because there will always be higher benefit cost ratio coming from saving four million dollar houses than from saving forty thousand dollar houses yet the number of units saved the number of people helped things like that those type of metrics don't calculate in a core of engineers benefit cost system that's one type of environmental justice issue i would tell you is really beginning to show up another thing i would say is there should not be a buyout without at least particularly in lower income areas without there being an basically uh, guarantee that there's housing available for the people that are being bought out. And so we're now looking to try to link housing policy and uh, buyout policy so that the timing is such that we may be able to have adequate housing uh, pretty much well away, you know, well underway by the time that we get to where we're actually talking about buying out these houses. And it's really about setting up a system that's structured differently than the system we have now and what we have found is a lot of our nonprofit groups have come together with us on this grassroots initiative. And I'd say half our time has been on social equity issues and trying to understand how that integrates into essentially redoing Houston after Harvey. Just, right, we have a question. Okay. Yes? That is a perfect question. I asked that question when I was doing my PhD research to people about what they thought and what they were seeing. Pretty much in the Alaska Native villages out on the land, people, no one will deny climate change. I didn't have anyone deny climate change at all. And most people did think it was anthropogenic. There were a few people who had this really different world view of it and kind of viewed it as these long cycles that Native peoples had lived through thousands of years ago and they would manage to prevail. So they weren't as concerned about it, like I'm up in arms about it, but they weren't so concerned about it. And then when you talk to the federal officials and the state officials, um, they make statements like, I'm agnostic about the causes of climate change. And you get um, like our Governor Walker who wants to drill more so that they can pay for relocation. 
um, they're very tied to the drilling. And so you do have some who, who believe in climate change, but an example of a, a recent um, state plan, we had an Alaska Arctic Policy Commission to have a, a plan for Alaska and the Arctic. And two people I interviewed told me that when making that plan, they were not allowed to use the word climate change. And it sounds like mm -hmm. Alabama or something. But they could say changing Texas. climate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? There, there are several plans to protect the area. I think that the question is at what cost and which alternatives. Uh, there are alternatives. Uh, one's called the Ike Dyke down on the coast. That is about a $10 billion plus solution that would basically put one of those big gate structures across the primary pass between the Gulf of Mexico and Galveston Bay where all of the fisheries migrate through. And so there's, you know, the, the real huge question about environmental impact there and uh, whether we're even going to have that discussion. So far, environmental review has survived the appropriations process. I am very worried about the Water Resources and Development Act that's coming up and whether environmental review will be cut out. The advocates of that pr particular project, I'm not one of them, have advocated for the essentially exemption of that project from environmental review citing New Orleans in the fact that most of the post-Katrina work was done with that, with basically post-facto environmental review. Uh, it's a very different situation because I don't think there was as many environmental issues with closing Mr. Go as there may be from putting a pass up across or putting a structure across the pass. But, you know, that, you know, it, you know you've got a lot of money being thrown around right now, although I, I, will, I will tell you to do something that's a fun exercise. Go pull the appropriations bill and look at the Corps of Engineers section and read it. And we got any law students in here? <laughs> okay, I've got one. You know, I'd like to have you have that as an exam question and basically say, what does this, it's a, it's a single sentence that allocates $30 billion. And it has 500 and I think 25 words in it. And nine provided, however, that's but it's all one sentence. And everybody that reads it says, we got what we wanted. That's the way we're doing business right now. It's that, crazy. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily something new. Uh, what happens in Congress uh, is that they uh, can't really put out anything explicit that people can agree upon, so they put in some extremely vague language, vague language and they say, the courts are going to tell us what it means. Uh, I'm not joking. I'm quite, I'm quite serious. We had a, a, a Federal Bar Association sponsored uh, speaker the other year who uh, talked about having been in the House uh, Legislative Council's office uh, and they were told you have to get this uh, section of the Clean Air Act done by tomorrow morning. Uh, but there was no agreement on what the substance of that section was supposed to be achieving. So. They put together whatever they could do with a lot of vague language in it and said, ultimately, the courts are going to have to uh, interpret that for us. And uh, although it's been bounced back by the Supreme Court once or twice, ultimately, that's what's going to happen. Uh, and that, that was the uh, Clean Power Plan debacle, you may recall. So what was it, Section one, one, 116 or thereabouts? D? Well, it depends on who these, you're talking about with these people. The people who actually do the physical drafting are the people in the House Legislative Council, and they take their orders from the politicians. Where do the politicians take their orders? I can't say. I mean, and I would actually challenge that it's the corporations that are calling these out, because the question was about the industry and industry impacts, and they're very concerned about trying to get a, a, a different view of things taken. I mean, BP had its trading floor shut down with Harvard. Now, that's different than a refinery shutting down. They could not buy and sell oil. And they're more motivated than they have been in the past, but I think in Houston we have an unholy alliance where basically industry was given control over air issues 
and the developers and engineers took over the flooding issue. And now we're trying, you're seeing that perhaps uh, breaking down a bit. That's sort of just a historical division of interest. Bar what, what have you seen in, uh, in other uh, Pacific areas, like Russia, like the Marianas? Oh, Russia actually has a, a wonderful wealth of environmental law in place. I uh, don't know that it's often followed. Um, so I, I don't know enough about the disaster law or that kind of thing. Um, Russia, actually, they have similar patterns of, of flooding in the interior area. With the, um, it, What happens in our interior of Alaska is the ice jams. Ice will build up and then create this dam, and then water will, will um, get flooded out into the surrounding area. Russia just puts like, coal dust on that to make that melt, and so they have some different ways of doing it in Russia. Um, the Northern Mariana Islands, they're grappling with a lot of the same issues that Hawaii and other Pacific Islands are. And Northern Mariana Islands has the benefit of being a U.S. jurisdiction so they can get FEMA money. Other islands that are affiliated with the United States can get USAID money. But a lot of it is these kind of hard infrastructure things that people want to put in place, um, which is a trade-off because people also want their beaches over there. So what, if anything, are other jurisdictions besides the U.S. doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change itself? The, not, not the specific solutions, but the overall problem. And I like what Jim was talking about when he talked about the Netherlands example of making way for the water. And I know that New Orleans was interested in that because there were, a few years ago, something called the Dutch Dialogues, where someone from, I think David Wagner, an architect here in New Orleans, was talking to people in the Netherlands about how that might look in, in New Orleans. So I know they were talking. Um, I don't know if anyone who would be in charge of making those decisions was really involved and would move that forward. We are, we are so heavily invested in New Orleans as it is, at least the privileged parts of New Orleans. And, and that's a very difficult topic to go into because this is a place that's under sea level. And um, I, I love New Orleans. and. Will it continue to exist? Should it continue to exist in this present form with sea level rise and climate change? That is a really tough, tough question. Yes, sir. I spoke to David Wagner after a presentation in the last year. And, um, his pre and, and it, it was linked to green infrastructure. And the presentation also was very linked to what the Dutch are doing. So there's a big emphasis in the wall interior on green infrastructure. But after the talk, I went up to him and mentioned to him, well, what if we had a rain like Houston had? Would this process do any good? And his eyes kind of went blind. Mm -hmm. okay. No, I, I don't because know. It, it has a, it takes a part of it, but it's not the, right. the total solution. You know, but I don't think there's a. Doing some yeah, but there's there's probably no city in the world that could handle a Harvey rainfall right. over that period of time. But I think the question is, we're just going to be having to handle more and more, even smaller big rainfall events yes. than we've seen in the past. But I would say about the Netherlands, though, that's very interesting to me. We love the structural solutions that the Netherlands have. The Netherlands also have very serious land use structures, mm -hmm. or land use controls, where they actually regulate seriously where people live, they move people out of areas. It's been very controversial, but I mean, they they have a complete program. They also tax themselves significantly to pay for these improvements. We don't tax, we don't regulate land use, but we want the structure. So it's sort of like we're cherry picking without taking the whole package of the Netherlands, and in the process, we will not solve the problem. I'm afraid. So that's really kind of where I think these discussions need to go. There's something I've been wondering about the Corps of Engineers, since they're like the major you know, regulator and overseer of a lot of these things. I'm wondering if they are going to adjust their new normal for all their mm -hmm. approvals and projects and things to get up to, oh, we can't put it down there. You're going to have a major potential energy build up. If that dam fails, you're going to flood out people now. You know, that kind of thing. Because there's, we're in a new normal now. I would tell you that I, I saw an analysis by the head hydrologist from the Fort Worth district that was one of the best climate sensitive analyses I have ever seen. So I would tell you it's going to vary very much from district to district as to who the personnel are. 
these districts are very much like autonomous, autonomous republics. And there is not the type of central control that there used to be. So I would tell you it really, really varies by your local staff. I would tell you the Galveston district is not as well respected hydrologically as the Fort Worth district is. That's the, our two districts. I would, I would take issue uh, to saying that there's a new normal. Uh, I would say there are at least two new normals, one of which has to do with actual facts and data and stuff that people can't wish away by saying, well, I believe differently. And the other is the people in charge of what you do with those facts. If you're going to be uh, cleansing away any reference to climate change in official government documents, if you're going to prohibit the collection of information related to it, um, how much good <laughs> is, that, uh, is that stuff going to do? And, and even if you allow it to be promulgate, collected and promulgated, unless there's a political will to do something with it, it's not going to do you very much good. And I know I saw another couple of hands up there. Yes. I think what you'll say, I mean, I, that my answer to that is probably not if we had an alternative. I think the problem is that people who have been flooded are out of a house. They've got a mortgage. And the reality is the system pushes them back. And if we had a pot of money up here for buyout at that point in time, we could buy out a lot of people. But there's no pot of money up there. There's no kind of long-term buyout concept except in certain cases through FEMA where there's been multiple flooding. So unfortunately, there's not a good alternative that helps our people out that are caught in that situation. So on the one hand, yeah, I think that's the rational solution. I think it's a practical matter. It's hard to ever get there because we've got a big divide. Yeah. Puts a new meaning. Yeah. Well, we've had, we have basically adopted in the interim the 500-year floodplain at the Harris County level and going two feet above the 500. As a way of addressing this in the interim, the city is arguing right now about whether to adopt a similar measure or not. And the concern is that the city will not go far enough nor uh, be effective in what they're doing. But they are looking to at least try to get the elevations up. I mean, at the least, we've got to go higher. Yes, ma'am. And the stair steps were just a, an illustration, and you're right, it may not look exactly like that. My main point behind that was I really thought long and hard about should we have a brand new sweeping climate change agency or a brand new climate change law where you have one agency in charge of all relocations and all climate change adaptation. And I came to the conclusion that no, 
for a couple reasons. One, because it would have to mix in with so many agencies and laws that are already dealing with climate change adaptation. And two, because it is so hard to start a new agency or law. If you think about it, we did not get a new agency. The last time we got a new agency in this country, it took 9-11. And then we got the Department of Homeland Security, and that was kind of cobbled together out of existing agencies. So my main reason for advocating incremental steps is not so much that I'm like, yay, incremental steps. It's, it's more like my, my pessimism in thinking that we will not be able to get sweeping change. And I, I applaud, there are plenty of other outside box thinkers that are much more you know, creative in their thinking, and they will be the ones pushing these kind of larger solutions, like we need new agency. And that kind of makes people like me look normal, and I'm a little boring, and I, I'm pushing for maybe small word changes, maybe small appropriation changes. For example, we talked about the, the relocation or the house buyouts. Right now, that would be possible to do under the pre-disaster mitigation program that FEMA has. But that program may only get $90 million for the whole country for one year, whereas one disaster declaration can bring in billions and billions of dollars for a community, and then the hazard mitigation grant after that will give the state 15% of whatever the last disaster was to pay for relocation. So when I think of incremental terms, I think of, okay, let's change a few words and let's just give more appropriations to the pre-disaster mitigation program and maybe not so much for the disaster. Or in the specific case of Alaska, where you have these slow-moving disasters like erosion and permafrost that don't qualify for disaster assistance in Alaska, same thing down here in Louisiana. Think about a word change in the Stafford Act that would be adding the word erosion to the definition of disaster for which you get federal aid. I say that, I want to be cautious about that because FEMA doesn't want to do that. They don't want to open up the floodgates for all kinds of disaster declarations. So maybe you would have strike zones or certain qualifications for how that would work. Or maybe you would also broaden Housing and Urban Development Authority. They have community block development grants. But that doesn't include a lot of relocation. So maybe you just add the word relocation to the definition of things that they can support. And that's mainly what I mean by incremental changes, just small changes to the existing laws. And I, I have not thought out in terms of milestones for each community. It's a good question. Uh, Barrett, Jim. Uh, can you uh, talk for just a minute about the, the concept of Fukushima? Does this enter any, anywhere into your consciousness? It got a lot of attention in Alaska after it happened because there were things that washed up in Alaska and also Hawaii, and I was in both places shortly after that. And people um, got really concerned about it and talked about it a lot just after the fact, but um, shortly after that, it was out of sight, out of mind, and I haven't heard Fukushima brought up in years, actually. I'm getting a, a lot of kind of back and forth with some of the Japanese researchers about issues of warning, which is really something I didn't talk much about. But this whole idea of, of a warning system being a key element, uh, we don't have a community warning system in Houston. The Texas Medical Center built their own after Allison, and they had really no major flood problems during Harvey. They put in a basically a flood proofing system and then a uh, computer analysis that would tell them when they should shut the floodgates and basically they call everybody inside the medical center and say you're not leaving they call all the people that haven't come into work and say don't come into work and they shut it down batten the hatches and can survive uh, what that means though is you have to accept the reality of flooding and this is what I'm talking about living with flooding rather than thinking you're controlling flooding when you're setting up a warning system you're basically saying, look, we haven't protected you from flooding. We're going to try to help you drive around town better. I mean, our, our roads are our secondary drainage systems in Houston. And you, you will drown your car in most any medium-sized rainfall event. Uh, we can help on that. We can put out an app that said where the best roads were. We could put gates down to keep idiots from driving into the underpasses that have a sign that says the water's nine feet deep. And you still see a car driving into it. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you can't help people, but we can do a lot better than what we've done. But I mean, that's what we've gotten from Fukushima, is back and forth on the warning system, the warning structure, and frankly, how to live with danger. Yeah, and uh, I had a client once who served uh, in, in the military in the Pacific, said he uh, took a, a taxi ride in Singapore once, and the ta taxi driver took him right through one of those tunnels with the uh, warning sign right through the middle of the water and out the other side. Uh, so that was one way of maladapting to danger. Okay. Uh, 
Any last questions as we wrap up? And thank very much our guests for their long travels to be here and our, their interesting information.